So everything has been introduced, of course, as always, we do not have to believe everything that the uh, introducers say about someone. Um, I'm just your humble servant tonight. Hmm? <clears throat> but I will do my best and try to give you an overview of what has been going on in the field for the past 50 years. It's one of the things I really like to do, so it's on a meta level or even a meta, meta level. Okay. Um, we start, like I said, 50 years ago, and uh, when we do that, um, we go back to actually 1971. We go from zero to what I call the stratosphere in just 50 years. Um, this field started with a book by Ladislav Zgusta, The Manual of Lexicography. It was very humble, um, half a century ago, ago and since then, I claim that we have really reached stratospheric heights. 50 years later, that would mean 2021. And I also claim that actually the year 21 represents a milestone. It's like a first rocket was discarded and a second one took over um, to continue its trajectory. And as is the case for so many other, if not most aspects of human life, COVID-19 actually supercharged the change in gears. Now, the year 21, we were treated to more virtual conferences, more research articles, more innovative dictionaries than ever before. Even though some of it may be seen as the backlog from 2020 being released, metalexicographers have now tasted the future, and I claim that the future is here to stay. Given that metalexicography has now entered the future, we may contrast that uh, the present with the future with what has come before, as I will do in the next table and the next many tables that will follow. Now, the first line in the next table, I'm announcing it, will be actually what I have just said. And the next four lines may be read as a table of contents as they actually summarize the sections two, three, four, and five that are to follow. So here is that table. So the past is, it started with Gusta in a face-to-face -face world. And today and in the future, we have truly ended the virtual world, and it will become a hybrid world. Section two will deal with uh, the associations, the continental associations. We had them in the past. We already heard it a bit in the introduction from Yuki Otono. The associations uh, uh, exist now for all continents, and we now have also an active world body. We had a few, uh, section three, we had a few publications in the past past and we now moving to massive amounts of research output. Four, in terms of dictionary research, we used to use questionnaires and surveys, while now we have moved fully digitally to unobtrusive logging and the analysis of dictionary use. We were in a slow science via personal and public libraries and we now moving to fast, accessible um, data via dedicated tools. Now, um, some time ago at the Eurolex conference, one actually in, uh, in Belgium, Liège in 98, uh, Gregory Greffenstadt asked, will there be lexicographers in the year 3000? Of course, that's a very long shot, 3000, given we are only 20, what is it by now, 2023. Now, in tomorrow's talk at Wasera University, to which you're also all invited, I will show that there is still a chance slight, but there's still a chance for our dictionaries and our lexicographers to survive into the future. Now, if that is the case, it also makes sense to look at the future of our uh, scientific research. So the future of the discipline of meta lexicography, which is the topic of today. So in what follows, we will look at the various aspects of the meta lexicographic endeavor, and in places, we will also study the meta lexicographic repercussions of the Grand Dame of Practical Lexicography, which is Sue Atkins, who sadly passed away in that milestone year 21. Now, those who were there may remember that as a president of Eurolex, when I read her obituary, I actually invited everyone to go and see her last interview in conversation with Michael Randall, which is available on YouTube. Because in that interview, Sue Atkins masterfully 
surveyed the past half century of meta lexicography. Now I'm going to show you the screen shot that I made for uh, that obituary, uh, which actually summarizes her talk. You could see her talk. Can I point out someone's microphone is on so I hear echoing? Uh, I see, I hear myself again. Can it be switched off that person? Okay. So I saw Sue Atkins as uh, Jupiter, if you want, with a number of moons circling her. The first moon being John Sinclair, her brother. Then colleagues for her first dictionary, like Alain Duval. And then I won't read all the names, uh, all her in, in the bluish uh, circling around uh, herself. And then a second, on the second plane, you see the theoreticians come in, Beth Levine, Igor Melchuk, Chuck, Chuck Melfor, and so forth, uh, all the way, and it ends with Adam Kilgariff and Pavel Richley. So in her talk, her recounting of the first 50 years of the field, she mentioned all these names as milestone uh, lexicographers who contributed to the field. I will also come back to that visualization. Okay. Block number two, we move to the conferences, the conferences of each of the continental associations for lexicography. Now, soon after the publication of Zgusta's manual, remember that was 71, the first continental association for lexicography was formed, the DSNA in 75, which stands for the North American, uh, sorry, the Dictionary Society for North America, so for the North American continent. Now, over the next two decades, and I will show this in a in a table format in a minute, uh, over the next two decades, this effort to form continental associations over and above the local ones, like the one, eh, the, the Iwasaka Linguistic Circle, eh, the Special in Interest Group for Lexicography, so over and above local ones, national ones, and even regional ones, this idea to have continental associations was copied on several other continents. So here is a table format. We start with the DSNA in 75. Then um, eight years later, we have uh, Euralex that was formed. Um, another seven years later, Australex. And then in quicker succession, another five years later, Afrilex. Two years later, Asialex, hmm, uh, which is very relevant today. Then as you've heard in the introduction from Yuki Otono uh, later this year, um, well, it, they already have a working group uh, and then they have a, a name already, it's America Lex, and it will be launched actually officially in October 23. These are the continental associations. Then we have something that cross cuts these two. We have also ELEX, which is not an association, but it deals with electronic lexicography throughout the world. And then we have a body and alliance on top of that, which is now known as Globalex, formed in 2018. Now, key figures in setting up these associations are uh, for the DSNA, Edward Gates, for Euralex, Reinhard Hartmann, and again, Sue Atkins, uh, Bill Ramson for Australex, Dani Prinsler and Rufus Haas for Afrilex, and Amy Chi and Gregory James for Asialex. Now, there was for a very long time no association covering Central Central and South America. I pointed that out in a number of publications and an opportunity arose at uh, the DSNA 2019 Congress where I happened to meet both Spanish and Portuguese speaking lexicographers from South America. And uh, I tried to convince them that uh, we need an association covering that last continent. And indeed, three years later in 21, a working group was eventually formed with representatives from not just Latin America, but also the Caribbean, and they baptized themselves America Lex. This working group will hold its first conference in October 23 this year in Brazil. And at that occasion, the last continental association will be officially inaugurated. So, cross cutting that, we have ELEX. It's a series of conferences first organized again in Belgium in 2009, and it focuses exclusively on electronic lexicography uh, in the 21st century. 
So while not a continental association, given its focus, it certainly has the potential to go around the world. Although so far they have had all their conferences in Europe. I keep prodding them and I hope they will start moving, I don't know, say first to North Africa or Israel, and they start going to either Africa or Asia in that way and then beyond that. Now, in addition to that, we also have Elan Kerneman's effort. Uh, he baptized it PPLEX. He wanted to bring all of us together. I had a variation of that uh, 10 years later. I call it Pangealex, you know, at a time when all the continents were just one big continent. So this idea to have one group where just everyone is involved uh, has been uh, uh, thought of a number of times. But in the end, in 2018, it happened, thanks to Ilan Kerneman, we now have Globalex. So the, for the first time in human history, all continents will have their lexicographic association by the end of 2023, with a global alliance set to become ever more active. Now, learned societies exist not just the name, their main activities for their members to meet. We have to, like now, we have to talk and do something. Now, as I will show in the next table, all continental associations have met regularly since their foundation, typically biannually, with only Afrolex opting for an annual format and Asialex having switched to that format recently. And then when you have several and they have to decide on how to, in which years, the odd or the even ones to organize their conferences, uh, your legs purposely chose to do theirs in the off years of the DSNA. And then later, ELEX chose to organize theirs in the off years of Euralex. So perhaps that's easier to, to follow. Here in table format, you see all the associations when they were founded. We have already seen that. Then a summary of when they meet biannually, mostly biannually or annually and so forth. And whether also, we'll come to that later, they have proceedings or not. For America, Lex, it still has to be announced. Eh? But for the others, we have the data and we see, say, that the SNA has met 23 times, Euralex 20, Australex 20, Afrolex 26, of course. Eh? They meet annually. So now they are leading the pack in number of uh, meetings. Asia Lex 16 times so far. Then when we move to Elex 7, and we already have four plus four, so eight Global X workshops. So in half a century now, over a hundred such conferences were, uh, if you add up all these numbers, over a hundred such conferences were organized or on average two per year. Of course, averages are dangerous uh, it, because in this case, it hides an important fact that over time, there are simply ever more continental meetings given we only had one at the beginning and many more, well, for all continents now today. So, if you see this graphically, uh, uh, every two years, that's the blue little bar for the DSNA. Then your leg starts to intercalate. Then we add Australex. Then we add Afrilex. Then much later, 2009, we have on top Elex. And since 2016, we added a Globalex. Is that possible? Black Globalex conference workshops, yes. So you can see it goes up, 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 up. And there's one special year, 21, again, our milestone year. And why is that? Because due to COVID-19 in 21, we had conferences at the same time for the DSNA, Asialex, Afrilex, Elex, Australex, and Euralex, as well as two Globalex workshops co-locating with the last two. So, And that in a time span of just four months. Now, of course, very few of us attended all Eight meetings, I think there was only one uh, myself. Now, this was made possible by turning actually a necessity, the worldwide travel restrictions into a virtue, meaning to meet, have to meet virtually. Now, here is not the place to sing the praises of the virtual format, even though it is comparable to the move from paper to digital. Um, it may convincingly be argued that the future of our meetings will be at least hybrid. Some of us will be physically present in the room. Others will only meet via the streamed version like today. And uh, either 
in part or in full. And we will also move to a format with single day registration. So everything becomes possible. Actually, as a matter of fact, fact at the last Euralex conference, we had a one free hybrid day so that anyone from outside could look in and follow the proceedings for free for that one day. Now, all of this means that uh, lexicographers in the future will have far more opportunities than ever to continue to meet and we will have new issues like the differences in time zones. As you know, it is early morning in Europe. It is very late, uh, if not way too late, in Australia and America right now. Um, it is one of the issues we, meet, we encounter at Global Lex. It is very hard for us to meet all at the same time because of those time zones. Now, another adva uh, added advantage is, uh, has also become apparent is that, uh, while previously, since the formation of e ELEX, um, only ELEX had made a serious effort to record its presentations uh, at its physical meetings to be streamed live, as well as to be offered online after the event at no charge for everyone. In 21, the presentations at each, each, and every one of the continental lexicography conferences was recorded. And most of these also remain available to the world at large without any restrictions. And the table I will show next will also suggest that this will become common practice going forward. So this table shows again the associations on the left, whether or not they had recordings prior to 21, uh, the ELEX block, yes, since 2011, 2011, 2013, 15, 17, 19, 21, all of them available. The only other one who had actually one prior to 21 was Eurolex in 2018, but that was one organized by actually the team um, which also organizes ELEX. GlobalX, that's uh, 2020, um, so during Corona as well. But had the recordings in 21, you see plus signs throughout for everybody. So while the current picture, if you look back at where everything is stored, huh, so some are video lectures, others are YouTube channels, uh, um, still others um, are Google Drives. Uh, while it may look messy in, in the future, I am pretty sure that all this will converge and we will settle on uh, one type of uh, repository. So it will become ever easier in the future to hear and see one another's talks and the discussions that ensued, both live and stored forever in the cloud. That, of course, does not mean that the video format, the format we're actually using as well right now, will, will replace the written out text, which appear in conference proceedings. So what about conference proceedings now? So new block, block number three, the publications of the continental associations for lexicography. Not all continental associations produce proceedings of their conferences, and sometimes there are good reasons for that. As Michael Adams uh, pointed out in a series of articles, um, well, if you already have a newsletter and a dedicated journal that is linked to your association, there may be no need for it. Nonetheless, Euralex, Asialex, and Elex religiously publish their conference proceedings, Australex and Globalex only sometimes, and the DSNA and Afrolex do not have them at all. In the case, well, actually in both cases, the DSNA has its own journal, Afrolex as well, and their reasoning as well, uh, that covers what we need. Now, at the current rate, this means that an average of about a thousand extra pages with conference proceedings on dictionaries, dictionary makers, and dictionary research appear each year. So it's an amount that has been growing over the years as well. Now, an analysis of the first 15 years of uh, Euralex proceedings has shown that the impact of those publications also grows from conference to conference. So looking into the future, there does not seem to be any signs that this continuous upward trend would curb down. All but one of the continental lexicography associations, 
also publish their own journal, as we will see here in this table. So again, we see the associations when they were founded, the journal that is linked to their associations, who the publisher is, and, so, and since when they had the journal. So I will summarize this. The DSNA has dictionaries. ULX uh, started the International Journal of Lexicography and it is still associated with it. Afrolex has lexicos and AsiaLex, as you know, has lexicography. Now, in an early and beautiful example of cross-continent cooperation, the DSNA and ULX also joined forces to, to produce the journal Lexicographica. And in addition, they also have a book series, Lexicographica Series Maior. Now, all these journals, of course, started to appear after the associations were formed, with one exception. If you go back to the table, you will see for the line of Afrilex, uh, Afrilex was founded in 95, but Lexicos exists since 91. And it's a little time warp there. It's because the journal was initially published by the Bureau of the Woordenboek van de Afrikaanse Taal, so the Dictionary of the Afrikaans Language, the WAT, the WAT, which became, after Afrilex was formed, the mouthpiece of Afrilex. Now, Globalex, by definition, is a champion of operation, uh, cooperation. Four of its workshops so far took place at LREC conferences. So LREC, that's the International Conference on Language Resources and Evaluation in 16, 18, 20, and 22. And those proceedings, those proceedings of the workshops are always published in the LREC conference proceedings. When they present at LREC, if the focus is NLP lexicography. They also have a second track uh, at GlobalX that deals with neologisms, and these run always in parallel with our continental conferences. Where are they published when it is a GlobalX workshop? Well, the first one was at the DSNA 2019, for obvious reasons. It was published in dictionaries. The second at Euralex was published in IGL. Third one at Australex, it became a book in the Lexicographica series Meyer. And the fourth last year at Euralex was simply published in the proceedings. And going, going forward, and it is relevant for today, uh, the next one at Asia Lex 23 will be published in the Journal of Asia Lex Lexicography. Or rather, the papers will be submitted for publication and we'll see if they are accepted and we'll see what will be published. Now, a detailed analysis of, of journals, as I did for Lexicos and IGL, reveals that ever more material appears in them, even when the publisher, as OUP did recently, sets page limits. Uh, for example, in June 2018, um, for IGL, they introduced a different typeface, a much smaller font size, some of us can't read it anymore, a new layout, so that more and more text could be crammed in on the same number of pages. Then the question becomes, is more, more publication outlets, more pages, smaller font to include more articles, also better. So in re reformulated, what is the true impact of all this increased publishing? Are we perhaps ending up with hundreds, perhaps thousands of research articles that simply end up never being cited? Well, to try answering this question in a concise way, I manually built a Google Scholar profile for each of these four journals. So they are linked, listed there, dictionaries, IGL, lexicos, and lexicography. I, I collected all the data for each of them, cleaned it up a bit, had to weed out a few funnies. I'll show you why. Um, why? Because, well, people metrics is one of my hobby horses. I like to count. I like to see what's going on in the field. Um, but it's not the topic of today, so I'll only focus on a few of the basics. The screenshots that you see next, I could go live, but that involves uh, sharing different screens. So let's uh, just go live with, sorry, let's use the material that I collected a few days ago on the 13th of February 23. Here are the sites. It doesn't go all the way to the 75 when it started, but here are the sites in dictionaries so far. The number of articles cited, uh, if you look at 20, 
21 and 22, it is, uh, you, you reach 230. So there are 230 citations to work published in dictionaries before those years. There's a spike. I'll come back to that spike for 2014. The next one that you see on your screen are the sites per year for IGL. It has been growing. And now it has been plateauing since at least a decade. Three, we do the same for lexicos. I see also this upper trend reaching about 600. And finally, the journal uh, of Asia Lex Lexicography, which, uh, well, it is going exponential. Of course, it's still a very young journal going from literally zero to 100 in the screen, but I'll tell you it is actually more, if not much more. So with Evermore material, the number of times that material is cited year after year goes up, as we've seen for dictionaries, lexicals, and lexicography. But it seems to have plateaued to reach the limit uh, for IGL. IGL averages these days about 1,300 citations per year. So the more for IGL, does not seem to have an increased impact. All their trickery to cram in more and, and make people suffer and wear glasses to be able to read it does not have, in terms of citations, an increased impact. On the other hand, the plateau that they reach, 1,300 per year, is way above the current number of annual hits for dictionaries, which is 230, lexicos, which is 600, and as you've seen, lexicography for now, about 100. So I said for now, because for lexicography, the Journal of Asia Lex, it is important to point out that an article by Adam Kilgariff and his colleagues in 2014 called The Sketch Engine, 10 years on, which was published in lexicography, has not been included because Google Scholar lumps the citations of that particular article with those of the one that came before 10 years earlier, The Sketch Engine which was published in the Eurolex 2004 proceedings. So no matter what you do, whether you, you, you try to split, whether you try to assign it to one of the two, uh, only the proceedings of Eurolex or only the Journal of Asia Lex, after a few minutes, Google regenerates the statistics and mixes the two again. So there is no good way. Uh, it's because of the fact that the main title is exactly the same and seemingly Google Scholar uses this uh, and not author names and other details, publication years and so on and so on to differentiate between the different papers. So because it's not possible, it's easier to take it out and just add a footnote. Be careful, there's other also that other publication. Okay, that's one problem. The other problem, a single article can also carry an entire journal. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's uh, sorry, that's the that's what I just said. So the Kilgariff article actually carries the journal the lexicography. Um, I did a quick sample check, and I think it has been cited a thousand, if not about two thousand times since it has been published in the Journal of Asia Lex. But that's huge compared to the three hundred and forty-five times for all the other articles in the same journal during the same periods. Now, a single article can also produce a huge spike for just one year in the data. Uh, the, the Kilgariff one now will always uh, distort the picture forever and ever. But you can also publish one article that distorts the entire picture. And we saw that for dictionaries. David Just in 2014 wrote a Jubilee article. And in that article, in the reference list, he quotes every single item that was published in the preceding 34 years. So basically, he eliminated all those that had never been cited and gave everyone one citation. Now, of course, that distorts the picture because, well, it's an overview, it's a jubilee, but at the same time, these are not actually real citations. So in order to smoothen these things a bit, um, it is uh, to smoothen them out, it's uh, good to work with Windows. Think of the impact uh, factor that is being calculated. They always work with Windows two years, three years, five years. Mm -hmm. um, so the next table that I will show you uses uh, such uh, smooths. Um, 
and it will use the overall picture as well as the last five years, as well as the H index and the I index. H index is the, la is the largest H, so that H publications have at least H citations, and I10 is the variation on the H. It's the number of publications with at least 10 citations. So these are now one, two, three, four blocks, each of the journals. We start with dictionaries, chronologically, then IGL, lexicos, lexico, lexicography. You can see uh, over the past five years and all uh, the different statistics. So for dictionaries, we have an all 3,000 plus citations, IGL 25,000 plus citations, lexicos 6,000 and so far for lexicography 345 plus the ones from the Kilgariff article say 1,000. Then you see the H and the I indexes. But let me summarize that for you on the next slide. Mm -hmm. So the fight, despite the fact that dictionaries is the oldest, IGL clearly comes out top in terms of number of citations. They're followed by lexicos, then dictionaries, and finally, lexicography. It is, of course, still a young job. As to the question of how many articles end up never being cited, the four journals surprisingly behave very, very similarly. Uh, on the next table, I will show you the details. Uh, we have tabulated the number of published items per journal. And... Um, we also corrected mm -hmm. so for the funnies like uh, the Kilgariff one and the David Jost article to arrive at the following. Mm -hmm. So the lines to be read is from the second one onwards, the dictionaries with a star, so the corrected one, then IGL, lexicos, and lexicography. Just jump to the column not cited in percent. Not cited, eh? so never ever cited in Dictionaries, 45% of the material. IGL, 40.9. Lexicos, 41. Lexicography, 41.2. So basically, 41, 41, 41. Maybe a coincidence. And then for dictionaries, 45. Last column, cited more than once, so at least twice. In dictionaries, only a third. And in IGL, lexicos and lexicography, about half in each case. So it turns out that the percentage of articles never ever cited in the four main journals of our field is exactly the same for IGL lexicos and lexicography, 41% and a bit more for dictionaries. And given that hapaxes mean very little, eh, we can do away with uh, the, the ones-offs. We see the, eh, in the last column that only half of everything we write and publish is cited more than once. And if you publish in dictionaries, it drops to just a third. Of course, this may be a general trend in publishing, but I'm only focusing on lexicography. I wanted to know what is the state of what we write, who reads, okay, and then also refers to what we wrote. On average, for every five journal articles we write, Two are never cited. And given there's a scene throughout these four journals, no matter if the journal is uh, four decades old or a more recent one, of course, that implies that producing more gets you noticed. Eh? It's always two out of five. So if someone in our field writes one article, the chance that it is cited on average is 60%. Because 40% is not cited. If you produce more, if you produce 10 articles, well, you can hope that on average, six of them will be cited. If you write 160 and so on and so forth. So producing more gets you noticed, but the percentage doesn't go up. It remains two out of five are never, ever cited. And we saw if you go to the, if you delete the once offs, it goes down to half or down to even third. Now, probably more interesting than knowing that, well, two thirds of the material that we publish is never cited is to know what is cited and what attracts most citations. So thanks to the Google profiles that I built, 
Uh, uh, you, you can look at that and study it um, to go a bit quicker. Uh, I have prepared screenshots and on the screenshots, you can see the top 15 for each of the journal articles. We start with the DSNA, the journal dictionaries. Uh, by far the most uh, cited one is an article from 1988, 134 times. And then you can go down, but it's good to see Sue Atkins, uh, uh, one of her more theoretical papers in 92, um, followed by, well, you can read it, an article from 79, 79, the dictionary of old English and so on and so forth, the first half, and we continue. To the second half. I will summarize this so we don't have to look too long at this. This is the same for IGL. Uh, as you can see, the top ones deal with WordNet, FrameNet, uh, word families, another WordNet, the English verb. Then uh, number six is an article, an early article of mine. And we continue down the list uh, with actually similar uh, topics. We also see Adam Kilgariff, one from 97, putting frequencies in the dictionary. One, luckily also, and it's a good one, from Sue Atkins and Krista Marantola, monitoring dictionary use. I think we can all agree these are very important papers, and this is, of course, picked up and confirmed by its citation numbers. For the journal Lexicos, you will see the same names and same topics coming up. They clearly have a, a, a problem there. Yes. Um, and we go on, it mirrors actually the first page with basic things like what is lexicography, who is a lexicographer. And then finally we go to, and I've included it this time to give you an idea, but be careful, the sketch engine 10 years on, 3000, that includes of course the publications also uh, of the earlier one from Euralex. So if we don't, Look at that. Beyond that, uh, what is popular so far in the journal of Asialex? It is um, Marie Collot Lom on terminology, paper from Poland, um, the OE of someone from Oxford published, um, phraseology, dictionary skills. Uh, it's a popular topic in Asia. Um, and so on to page two. Now, if I try to summarize this, it is clear that each of the four journals in the end has its own identity. If you look at the topics, dictionary, likes theory, dictionary use, translation, translations, combinations, examples, neologisms. Yeah. Looking at IGL, we see all these nets, the word nets, the frame nets, then also dictionaries, digital dictionaries, corpora, computational aspects, use, combinations. What is popular in lexicals? Also theory, but with a focus on LSP. Digital dictionaries, corpora, computational aspects, use. Popular in lexicography, dictionary software, that's the Kilgariff article, and frame based terminology, dictionary culture and skills, use, dictionary apps, and phraseology. Looking at the languages dealt with, clearly they're all very biased. Dictionary stands to deal with the historical changes of English. And they want to know where they come from. IGL, clearly the main focus is English, present day English. Lexicos is so theoretical that there is hardly any African language, which you would assume uh, it's nearly as if they are against language and lexicography, also English, but then Asian English or English as a foreign language. Lastly, if you, in terms of authors, uh, Lexicos, as I said, clearly has a, a problem and the same names keep coming back. But if you look at dictionaries, IGL and lexicography, you see, uh, and I won't read them, but all the big names of the field uh, keep coming back. Judging from these top 15s, and of course it's the top 15, you should look beyond that as well to have a good analysis. Uh, Lexicography, and so the Journal of Asia Lex, is probably the most local in its continentalness, eh? with uh, really contributions from people from Asia, especially. Just look at the names that are listed there together with the uh, countries of origin, even though they some of them may be working elsewhere at the moment. 
And only a few names actually have an impact across two or three or even all four journals. And I have listed them there. Of course, they include Sue Atkins, Adam Kilgary, Rufus Haas, Hilary Nacy, and so forth. Now, more intriguing is that Sue Atkins, remember uh, her recounting of the first half century, uh, included no less than 11 of the most cited authors in, the fur, uh, in, in these four joint journals. Um, and they are listed there. And her recounting includes, chronologically speaking, the last five from her summary. So even as a non agenarian Sue Atkins was actually fully in the present. And with that, because I say that we are already in the future, uh, predicting the future. Okay. We move from uh, uh, publishing to now a very brief section on research into dictionary use as, and that's the point, meta lexicography. Because indeed, as stressed by Rufus House, at some point in the past, meta lexicography was considered very separate from dictionary research. Which dictionary research itself was subdivided into four categories uh, in Wigan 98, and one of those was research into dictionary use. Well, as Hartz points out, this distinction is no, no longer upheld. And as a result, in addition to the meta lexicographic endeavors discussed so far, the actual study of how dictionaries are used is now part and parcel of the field of meta lexicography. Now, that is ironically one of the aspects where Sue Atkins did lose touch with the present and uh, failed to foresee the future, eh? that the, the direction of dictionary use uh, is changing, and the research on dictionary use. It's a field to which she herself uh, contributed a lot, a major study summarized as Atkins 98. And which is this future direction? Well, it is actually the, the unobtrusive logging and analysis of real, meaning digital, online dictionary use. Overviews of this field, of the current and the future potential, have already been written. Uh, so I would refer the interested person to those overviews from Poland. We have a Zimianko, 2018, and from Germany, Caroline muller spitzer and her colleagues also 2018. And within that group of future ways to study dictionary use, a particularly promising venue is the use of eye tracking technology to study dictionary consultation. And of course, Yukio Tono, who is with us, that's one of the very early major studies published in IGL in 2011, and Robert Leff, and uh, I think he's also with us, uh, that's also an, uh, a nice study himself and gives an overview in 2018 published in Lexicos. Now, on a more basic level, recent studies have also shown the potential of carefully analyzing up to a decade's worth of online dictionary logs, revealing not only the real, unobtrusive dictionary usage behavior, but also allowing for new insights into things like graphical usage interface design in the context of lexicography. But that was a topic of yesterday's presentations, uh, which we held at the Tokyo University of Foreign Study for the research group TOLK, which stands for Tokyo African Linguistics Not. So I will not say more on that. I think the video will become available. Those interested in that can see a very detailed study of uh, an online dictionary for Swahili and what you can do with it, which was based on an article that Robert Leff, Sasha Wolfer, and myself wrote and published in an Asian journal, Gemma. Okay, now we move to bringing everything together through a tool, Elexifinder, a tool which has the potential to browse all of the world's meta-lexicographic publications. So we've seen this worldwide annual output that keeps growing. Uh, it, but it includes more than just the published Congress papers that we have already seen and the journal articles that we have mentioned so far. Um, as the scientific output of our discipline, 
is also found in several other journals, obviously, monographs, book series, edited collections, festschrifts, as well as manuals and handbooks. Whether they focus narrowly on lexicography or linguistics in general, whether it is written in English as well as in many other languages, you have a whole tradition in Polish, a whole tradition in Chinese, a whole tradition in many other languages, French, of course. So how will future students of lexicography, dictionary makers, metalexicographers, metalexicographers navigate this wealth of data? Now, a good candidate is Elexifinder which is a prototype discovery portal for lexicographic literature produced by the Alexis project, which is available at that website or just by Googling Alexifinder, and which has been designed by Isto Kossem and David Lindemann. It's currently, the database currently holds two, what am I saying? 6,500 articles and books in uh, Alexifinder 2.0. Now, in order to illustrate what Alexifinder can do, we can return to who else the output of Sue Atkins. Alexifinder 2 has 18 articles that she co-wrote, which clearly is an undercount. It's an incomplete set. But to illustrate, we will continue with those articles. Now, in the first screenshot that you see here of Alexifinder, which was produced by Alexis, that's the logo at the top left. You see, of course, that Sue Atkins herself was the co-author or the sole author of all 18, and you see her main contributors for those in the database of Alexifinder. Apart from, well, the main names, of course, are Michael Rundell and Adam Kilgariff as co-authors. The next figure, which you will see in a second, but I announce it, it's easier to, uh, to grasp quickly then. Uh, I asked Alexifinder to automatically generate a tag cloud from those 18 articles. And you will see in that tag cloud, or well, we can do it and then come back to this. So this is the tag cloud. So bigger and uh, yes, in the end, the colors are not important, but it is bigger is a more frequent keyword. So what stands out, and I've summarized it here, it is frame and frame net transitive and intransitive uses of verbs, and it refers to a specific article. The database Dante is one of the last projects she did. Uh, there is the reference uh, for an Irish bilingual. There is the reference. Lexicographic training, indeed. She set up the lexicography, lexicography masterclass. Um, and then her colleague, Kirk Gareth. So if you see this, you see that cloud, this is an impressive fit. All the more so that each of those tags is clickable. So if you click on any of them, say frame, you go to the articles that indeed then deal with frame. What does Alexifinder also do? It's concept graphs. There, to my um, um, opinion, it's less impressive. I would have wanted to see virtual dictionary in the center with everything around it. So virtual dictionary is, I think, the main concept that Sue Atkins uh, came up with. She also presented it as a keynote at the Eurolex conference, if I'm not mistaken, in um, 96. Um, it is a dictionary that only exists at the time of consultation. It assembles pieces, gives you the answer, and then kind of disappear. So this was 96. How futuristic can you be? Uh, unfortunately, there is no virtual dictionary in this concept graph, even though you can set parameters and move things around. Um, I did not get it out. So this is what you get. Uh, I didn't find it. And of course, you can play with this and pull things around. Um, but in this case, this concept graph was not very revealing. Especially that if you search for virtual dictionary in the entire uh, database, uh, a number of publications that are that are relevant are, and that refer to the original concept of Sue Atkins, they are mentioned. And but again, and surprisingly, even though the initial publication, which is in the database, uh, is there, it is not being mentioned when you specifically ask for 
a virtual dictionary. It's very beautiful, very nicely done by that team in Slovenia. You search for virtual dictionary, you see who has mentioned it. Uh, I seemingly have mentioned it in bibliometrics and lexicography. There's an article on experimental research and so on and so on. So these articles refer to it, but the one you really want to see immediately is not in the list that is offered. So the tool is not yet perfect, it's version 2.0. Now, well, everything that I've shown so far can be achieved in automated ways. Um, the next one is really, really impressive. Um, it's the result of assigning categories and subcategories to each and every publication in the database. Let me actually show it. Uh, so this is a summary of all the articles by Sue Atkins in Alexi Finder 2.0, seen via their, if you want, keywords. What are they about? So here I give an example, and which percentage in the end deals with dictionary use, within that with user profiling, and within that focuses on native speakers. So reversed native speaker user profiling when studying dictionary use. Well, 2.0% of the articles deal with that. It's the last, uh, it's in one of the outer rings in the purple, the, the one that is not shaded. You can click on that little pie and immediately go to the article or articles. There are more that deal with that. Very impressive, very nice tool to browse all of our outputs. Yes, this is what I just said, so we can continue. Now, and then if you then click on the last step, uh, again, you get, in this case, three articles, two published in IGL, one in Eurlex Proceedings. Yes, okay. Okay, now, bringing everything together, first a small discussion, then a conclusion. Now, of course, I'm not the first one who has... Uh, thought or written about the future, not at all. Um, but everything that came before was a kind of in an uneven way. Now I can quickly, and it's really meant as a joke and not as a scientific uh, little study here, um, illustrated with lookups, that's also a pun, you should say search, uh, lookups in Google. If you look up exact phrases, the dictionary of the future, Google claims, of course, it's not true, that there are 10,000 pages. What am I saying? No, 10 million pages that contain the phrase dictionary of the future. 800,000 that contain the phrase future of the dictionary. Future of lexicography. So, of course, you go to the meta level, 68,000. Lexicography of the future, just 11,000. Moving to future of meta lexicography, just two. And if you reverse that, you end up with zero. The numbers are clearly bogus because it is not the case that Google has an index and they have counted that in the index. They just try to predict it based on uh, anagram frequencies of the words that you use to search. But the pyramid that you see is true, huh? that there is more on dictionary of the future and nothing at all for meta lexicography of the future. Uh, so the topic of today is fully uncovered on the internet. That's how you have to read it. Okay, so, so far so good. Only the extremely dedicated or desperate colleague will actually also want to, uh, to check all those millions, even if they turn out to be only thousands or hundreds of pages. So Google is less helpful clearly also when it concerns the future of meta lexicography given there were just two or even zero publications. And if you follow through on those two, you will see that they are actually not even relevant in the present context. So throw out, we throw out the search engine and do it differently. I use my own database and I try to categorize what I found into six different groups. I looked for all the papers that deal with the future mainly by having the word future in the title. And I found two parameters to be able to categorize them. 
Other publications are practice inspired, theory oriented, or data driven. So practice theory or data. And on the second level, they either treat lexicography or meta lexicography. So you end up with a three by two little matrix, which looks like this practice, theory, data treating lexicography or meta-lexicography, 34 papers in all with their percentages. These are actually the papers themselves, so practice inspired group, first subsection when it's really very specific, either on a language or a region. English, so that's now the language, English dictionaries of the future, or another one, Cosa lexicography, past, present, and future. When it deals with a field or topic, Sobkovyak, uh, treated, uh, future, future dreams, but only on the phonetic level. Hilary Nacy, 96, deals with learner's dictionaries. More generally, the dictionary, the dictionary of the future, as an example. Or the last one in the list, Ogilvy, Sarah Ogilvy, the future of dictionaries and lexicography. That's the first group. Second group was the practiced inspired ones. Of course, our famous uh, work by Sue Atkins, where she invented and described the virtual dictionary is one of them. Group three, theory oriented ones. Then you get named Slaghaus. Four, theory oriented about the future of meta lexicography. Similar names, the group from Denmark together with Rufus Gauss. Finally, the data driven ones for lexicography and meta lexicography. A uh, data example for lexicography was the Grafenstadt paper that I quoted Will there be lexicographers in the year 3000? And the only one that I know of that talks about the future of meta lexicography using a data driven method is actually a talk I gave in Istanbul. Uh, a keynote at Ajalex. Resummarizing all of this, when lexicographers talk about the future of our discipline, they mostly do so based on their own experience in practical lexicography. And their suggestions concern new types of dictionaries or new dictionary features, either focusing on certain languages or certain regions or limited to certain fields and topics. 32% of all. The next category is when they use their own experience to make more general claims, supposedly valid for all dictionaries, 26%. A small number of colleagues also depart from their own practice, practice to make wider meta lexicographic claims, 9%. So in all, two thirds of all the work on the future is rooted in the lexicographic practice. The next group, good for two fifths of the total, 20%, is when colleagues depart from theoretical concepts to make their predictions of, of the future. And either they concern dictionaries proper, 9%, or on a meta level, um, 12%. And the last group, the smallest group, with just a tenth, 12% of the contributions, is those that concern studies with large quantities of data with which various trend lines are drawn and from which extrapolations are made to predict the future. These extrapolations either concern lexicography proper, 9%, and then lastly, meta-lexicography, that single contribution that, that I made in 2019. Now you can, huh, it's a table, you can view it uh, per row or per column. We just did the columns, you can now view the rows. So it's in another direction. Three quarters of all the contributions on the future concern lexicography, while just one quarter, rounded, concern meta-lexicography. Uh, and within the latter group, the data-driven data -driven, meta-lexicography, uh, which is the smallest, it's also the newest, and it has that one publication from Asia Lex 2019. You may recall, a few of you were there in Istanbul, that at the time I actually called that level meta, meta lexicography. And I argue it as follows. In meta, meta lexicography, 
a bird's eye view is taken of the scientific research devoted to the compilation of dictionaries. Let me reread it, but now at the numbering. A meta, meta lexicography, one. A bird's eye view is taken of two. The scientific research devoted to three, the compilation of dictionaries. Because level three is known as lexicography, compiling dictionaries. If you bring two and three together, right, you talk about dictionaries, you reach meta lexicography. But if you now take a bird's eye view of all the people who have talked about dictionaries, you combine levels one, two, and three, you are actually actually reaching meta meta lexicography. One may just conclude that all colleagues, when making predictions about the future of our field, somehow base their claims on facts, mainly observed and internalized the practice, or made up during thought experiments, the theoretical ones. Now, the base for the resulting claims is not always made explicit. When the predictions are data-driven, the base is the starting point, so it's a given. And this then also differentiates what I've been talking about today from everything that came before, because we have based everything, all our predictions about the future of meta-lexicography on extrapolations of quantifiable data. So making predictions based on an assumed continuation huh? Uh, of trends as seen in existing material of the past half century has the advantage that one is able to say why, because also how, the predictions were made. It has admittedly the disadvantage of being less sexy because one is not freewheeling, thinking of the, out of the box, one is not dreaming, as was done in a number of earlier ones, very excellent publications for everyone uh, to read, like At Atkins 96, uh, Anizan in 2002, or uh, indeed my own work earlier. So the lexicographic output, uh, if we now uh, we move from the discussion to the conclusion, the lexicographic output has been impressive. From a handful of conferences before 71, think of the first one organized in 1960 at Indiana University to well over a hundred continental, continental ones during the past half century. From conference proceeding in, in the single digits, the, the one from Indiana was in the end published in 62 as Householder and Supporter, to over 3,000 published conference papers since then. From a few dozen Meta lexicographic articles to over, in my database at least, 10,000 today. Starting in 2011, the ELEX conferences began to be streamed online, the presentations stored in the cloud. So it's a practice now copied by all other continental associations. So all this material is generating ever more citations. And overall, to come bring it back to Asia, the papers published in the Asia-Lex proceedings, for instance, generated over a thousand citations so far, while the four main lexicographic journals aggregated well over 36,000 and a half citations to date. So meta-lexicography is not really, as I, I claimed provocatively at the last year Lex conference, in an existential crisis, not at all. Sometimes, of course, the slow pace of some publication channels, as well as the realization that a considerable amount of what we write never ever attracts a single citation, is certainly food for thought, and this may be part of the discussion then. Lastly, we believe that Global X should take up an even bigger role than is currently the case in order to achieve a better mix of novel ideas and a healthy exchange of the practices used on other continents for the languages other than the Indo-European, even stronger, other than English. Because the current English bias is undeniable and the speakers and lexicographers working on this language, uh, to them, we would strongly like to say, read up on the challenges and the solutions that we have devised elsewhere. elsewhere. So, here is a list of articles that I read and that really help you see how to solve 
uh, lexicographic issues. For North America, read what is written there, Spans 21. South America, DT 2014. For Africa, you can read Prinsler or myself. Europe and North Asia, but then a focus on endangered languages, Salminan 22. Central Asia, Hill and Garrett. Southeast Asia, Bradley. For us further east here in Japan, please read Yuki Otono's work, Australia and the Pacific, Tiberger 20, uh, 2015. If you read this, and if more of us would stop only read on EFL and English lexicography, we will reach a point where things can cross fertilize, which is bound to result in more original dictionaries, smarter conference papers, better journal articles, and even better data for meta lexicographic studies like the one I'm doing now. And at that point, only at that point, there is a good chance that we will be able to reach the next level. We were already in the stratosphere. We will reach the meta lexicographic mesosphere. Thank you. Wow, I'm impressive. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Shilmoro Sensei, uh, for your informative inspiring and intriguing as well as ent entertaining talk i'd like to open the discussion to the floor now uh, if you have uh, any questions or comments just feel free to do so turn on the show hand well it's a small group so uh just anybody can go ahead Okay, can I ask one question? Uh, thank you, Jerry Morris. Uh, you know, uh, your meta lexicographic analysis is uh, solely based upon the different uh, publications from different lexes. Uh, but these days, uh, you know, uh, the boundary between uh, dictionaries and other reference sources online are kind of become unclear. So probably there are many other publications similar to our work, but which belongs to uh, other domains, such as NLP or lexical semantics or maybe computational linguistics. Uh, so, so do you have any, uh, for example, plan to, you know, in order to establish a new sort of a meta lexicographic framework in order to uh, in, in, do you have any plan to, for example, uh, search for other domains which were in which they're doing similar kind of work, but in a different way, so that we can sort of synthesize, you know, different activity, research activities? Uh, I, I, well, this is actually uh, partly suggested by your talk on uh, chat GPT you know, uh, the other day, but. Uh, you know, something's going on out there and uh, we should be aware of it, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yukio. Of course, I expected a question like this from you. Um, uh, Yukio, as a corpus uh, linguist, uh, known as Mr. Corpus, you, you can switch on the TV and, and see him explaining everything on, on Corpora here in Japan. Um, I witnessed it here. Um, it, it is true that... Um, to make it manageable, I, and especially today, I have focused on, you see how it grew. Uh, I've started with um, the Manual of Zgusta, then I moved to the association, then the conferences of those associations, then the publications of those associations. So of course you, you limit, you know what you're talking about on purpose. And then you reach a few thousand items. Now, in my personal database, contrary to the Alexifinder project, uh, I do exactly what you say. So. Um, if an interesting paper has been published in whatever journal, it ends up in my database. It's on lexicography. It must still be on lexicography, even, of course, if 90% also deals with social linguistics, corpora, language teaching, and so forth. So I do include it. But this is an ad hoc uh, process. Um, I don't know how much longer I will be able to continue doing this manually, because I, when I bring it in, I also turn it into a corpus text. I use corpus query software whenever I do something to search basically 10,000 articles and books at one go for concepts and names and so forth. So 
I already do what you say, and somehow what I say, uh, when it does not in the statistics, when I claim something, I somewhere I somehow I cheat. I I actually know about the rest or part of the rest as well. But of course, this is not a professional way to do it. You should actually be able to state this is in my database and have a method, even more important, that's what you were trying to get at, have a method to keep collecting it. If we want to do it, we could say, no, we should not do it. It should be an institute whose work should be to make sure that everything remains accessible and discoverable. That's the other important thing. Eh? Um, whoever wants to start on, say, neologism in Japanese wants a start back. You want to be able to type in somewhere or ask ChatGPT, give me a start back that deals with that. It is still missing. Eh? Um, Alexi Finder tries, but if it's not going to be updated, well, it will be soon, soon old news. Then it's only good for people like Sue Atkins who passed away, who will not produce more. But so if you want a tool going forward, you will need to need more. Uh, and, but I can already say, it's probably not me who will be doing it because it's of course a huge amount of work. But you're absolutely right that if, as I claim, I will claim tomorrow, there will still be lexicographers, there will still be dictionaries in the future. Uh, we will need also a different way to work with those tools. Uh, one of the claims, and we agree, is that dictionaries disappear into machines like this. They do things and we don't realize anymore they're there for us all the time. But we still, we lexicographers know it's a dictionary. We can do research on them. So given it's this format, the place where we publish is the LREC proceedings, the Corpus Linguistics conferences, the NLP conferences. And we need a way to, okay, find a subset of material from these places as lexicographers. Because we cannot read, it's, say, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, you cannot read up on everything. It's overwhelming. You just want, who has talked about this within the field or applied to lexicography? So that's, I don't, don't give you an answer, but these are my thoughts. But I can also say it won't be me. It's just too much work. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Thank you. Uh, I have a more quick comment about, uh, uh, you know, our U.S. Linguistic Circles Journal uh, lexicon. Uh, you kindly offer the space for putting our, you know, electronic edition at the Global X, I think, site. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, we haven't seen any, <laughs> any comments about the lexicon, but uh, uh, what do you think about our journal? <laughs> That's well, my personal interest. No, no, but it's good. And of course, I should have thought of it, given I talk for, for, for the group today. Um, but the way the way the article was structured uh, and the focus on continental associations, I didn't focus on the really local ones. But given I've been invited to talk about it, here it is. Um, first of all, the journal used to be in Japanese. So I cannot say anything prior to, I think, 1985. Give and take. Maybe, yeah, yeah. But from the moment it became first Japanese and English, and then recently it's all in English, uh, yeah. I can read. So the type of studies you do, I would put, if you look at the, the overview, um, first of all, they focus on EFL. It's English for foreign language, language learners, right? It's, Mostly, so the yes. Type, the <laughs> type of dictionaries you study, and these are dictionary you studies, are the learners' dictionaries, you know, the COBOL, the LDOS, the, that series, the OALD, and so, of course, the OALD, it was started here in Japan. So you focus on that. So with that, you immediately fall in the subcategory, if you want, of IGL studies. They are practice-based. So you're really in block number one of my, of my matrix. Mm. But in contrast to what they do in IGL, you take the space. You easily have an article of 100 pages and you yeah. need to what you do. And that is fantastic. And probably it's in the culture of Japan. <laughs> you cooperate. 
you you have easily 20, 20 authors. You only see that normally in, in medicine and, and in archaeology. But for linguistics, you rarely see that. We are all working on our own and we do solo publications. So your type of stuff has um, a table of contents and each section of your articles is actually developed by a specialist. Say, mm -hmm. now I'm talking out of my head. Uh, one study is the phonetics <clears throat> of a certain dictionary. The other looks at just the example senses. The third one just on the definitions in that specific dictionary. And then it is all brought together. So by bringing all this expertise into a longish, it's actually a monograph, a longish article, you got far better insight. Plus, this is not now the maker of a dictionary talking about their product. This is now not someone who threw the product at users and looked at how it is used. These are specialists who criticize or evaluate the product where it is supposed to be used. So it is, from my point of view, fully unique, and which is why I keep asking Kaori every year, please give me the electronic version so I can add it to my database. Please send mm -hmm. me the, the paper version so I can add it to my, my dictionary shelf because it is truly unique. And also why I suggested, let's put it online. Let, let, let's have the world discover what you do because it is very different, even though it's like I try to explain a subsection of block number one, uh, one A actually, uh, practice driven, focus on English. Uh, it is definitely lexicography, not meta lexicography. But uh, so I'm, you may think I'm doing it on purpose, but I'm an O and I'm only very positive about your journal and I'm All always right. looking forward Thank to you. it. Yeah, I, really appreciate, I appreciate your comments, yes. <laughs> Any any other questions hey. or comments, please? Uh, hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'd like I'm. I want. It was very interesting and did your presentation. Thank you so much. I'm interested in related with the uh, meta lexicography and AI relations. So, how do you think AI will affect the development of the of a meta lexicography, I, I don't know. It's it does fit, you know. It does fit on this topic or not? But I just wanted. To, I was wondering. Well, um, on the level of uh, lexicography, proper dictionary making, and everything that goes around it, there is no question. Um, we argue, David Joffe and I, who is also present. Uh, last Monday, we gave a presentation, and I think. Uh, well, I don't think, uh, I hope that we have convinced the community that this is the future. So as far as producing products is concerned, um, that technology will help us produce better products faster. Now, meta-lexicography, where can it help? And can artificial intelligence really help analyze, summarize, extract terminology, uh, evaluate, have opinions? Yes. I also think so, but I have not yet prepared a paper on it uh, because you see, this is already on a higher level. Eh? It's the, the meta, literally the meta level. Uh, already with the tests, uh, to try to write something about a certain topic, but on a meta level and the two, eh, the chat GPT one that is accessible, that keeps being improved, uh, already helps you in amazing ways. Eh? One of the gimmicks that you then use is uh, you start speaking and half an hour later, you actually admit that what you said earlier was produced by chat GPT. I didn't do it today because it's not about that, but we did it Monday. And in the publications that are forthcoming, we do that. So in the meta lexicographic material that will be published, we hope if accepted, there will be parts written by a machine. And perhaps you are aware, but Chat GPT has already been added as an author to scientific papers. In the field of medicine, in the field of mathematics, people already query these dialogue boxes and use the answers they get literally in their papers. And as a result, at least they're ethically correct, they add Chat GPT as an author. 
In other fields, entire books have already been written and published. And the author is Chat GPT. So also for this field, but I haven't developed it, but I can already state, given the experience that David Joffe and I had with the tool and, and what we do with it, yes, it will be able to help us on a meta lexicographic level. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to see, see the meta, uh, meta lexicography developer with the AI. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any others, please? There was something in the meeting chat, if I may, from Robert Leff. He, it's about that point where the sketch, sorry, where Google Scholar struggles to differentiate between articles in general eh, that have the same main title and a different subtitle. It can't take them apart. Um, we have, in this case, the, uh, the example of the sketch engine and the sketch engine 10 years later, or 10 years on it was. Um, I have a case where I have a part one and a part two, an article where one is the macro structure and the other is the micro structure. Google also can't keep them apart. So there are many, well, many, there are a few cases in our field like this. So I will read what um, Robert Leff wrote. It's in the chat. You can also see it. About the two sketch engine pieces, 2004 and 2014. For what it's worth, we could use Scopus reference search secondary documents to estimate the ratio of citations between the 14 and the 41. It seems to be six, seven. The numbers are 598, 712. This includes citations in Scopus index materials. So the ratio may be a bit different than another database, for example, the Google Scholar one. But if applied to Google Scholar, that would correspond to 1,400 for the other one, 1,600 for 1,600 for the second one. And I think the 1,400 one is then the latest one, 14, and 1,600 would be the Euralex one. Thank you, David, for, uh, sorry. Thank you, Robert, uh, for, for doing that for us. Yes, that's a good way. I use another sample method myself. And sorry, the smaller one is 2,004, my mistake. Okay, but it's roughly half, half. Eh? I, I guessed it's between one and 2,000. So let's say my median would have been 1,500. So we are about there. So I use my database, my way to do it. Uh, but as always, Robert has a <laughs> the better way. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we are running out of time. Maybe one last question from anyone. Uh, one quick question, Jim Morris. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the AmericaLex includes the U.S. and Canada, right? No, no, no that's the confusing they are part. Not. So, you see, I, I only facilitated, and actually, I I pushed for calling it Latin Lex, but seemingly, when we say Latin Lex, we don't feel the nuances that they feel in South America and the Caribbean. They some people who wanted to join and make the association said, uh -uh, especially those of English speaking islands in the Caribbean, if you call it Latin legs, we are again not included. Then we are not part of the DSNA, which is only the US and Canada. And then we are not part of Latin legs either. So they for months, if not a year even, but it was Corona, so it kept dragging on, discussed and had polls about how will we call ourselves and in the end, they settled for America, Lex. And I said, well, just like you, it's, the DSNA may not like that, but of course you can't be stopped. You can call yourself the Coca-Cola company, Lex, what? And you see, you can do what you want unless someone then sues you. So <laughs> they settled for that. Um, but I did not definitely not choose the name. I would have preferred, uh, I would have stuck to Latin Lex. Okay, I understand. I, I was going to ask how they stand to each other. Oh, okay, I got it. Well, I'm sorry to say this, but we are running out of time. I guess it's about time uh, we brought this uh, meeting to a conclusion. 
I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to Gilmore Sensei uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to talk about the subject of uh, quite topical and enormous interest. It was more than a pleasure that we were able to um, uh, have this opportunity to welcome you to this meeting of ours and to share your ingenuity and resourcefulness and perspicacity. Uh, my thanks go also to Tono Sensei, who was kind enough to be a liaison person with Jill Morris Sensei. And last but not least, uh, I would like to thank everyone here who showed up for this meeting. Thank you, everyone. I uh, bye to you all. Bye. All dismissed. <laughs>